Resident Evil has always been a series which is synonymous with speedrunning in my mind. Now it could be there's a long, rich, and wildly interesting history behind running them, or it could be there's about a million of these things I've been watching at GDQs for almost a decade. Well, in honor of Resident Evil Village's release last month, I thought it'd be the perfect time to take a look back at Ethan Winter's first foray into cheek slapping with 2017's Resident Evil 7. Now why don't you load up on that special water, and let's get into it. Now it might come as a shock to you, but it turns out Resident Evil 7 is a slightly bigger game than my old stomping ground Grow Home, with over 750 runners and over 20 potential categories. So with that in mind, I decided the best thing to do for this review is to take on the most popular category, which in this case is Easy New Game Plus, with over 300 runners on the board for PC. It's not quite as sexy as Knife Only Madhouse, but fair's fair. I mean, it's definitely not because Knife Only Madhouse was too hard. Well now that we're on the same page, let's get you ready for your first run. So you want to run Resident Evil 7? Well how bad do you want it? And really stew on that. Because getting to the point where you're ready to start running the game is without a doubt one of the largest hurdles along the way to becoming a good RE7 runner. I'm not playing. When researching the game, one of the first things you'll learn is that there are three different versions which offer varying levels of censorship and time savings. The one most people probably played is the uncensored version, but unfortunately that one's around 25 seconds slower than the censored Japanese Zero D version. Now if you're anything like me, you might be looking at your fully completed RE7 save sitting on Steam and wondering how can I get the COD version on Steam instead? Well, it breaks my heart to be the one to stomp all over your hopes, but you just can't and you never will. It hurts! It hurts! But just as all seems lost and you're ready to accept that it was your destiny to be a slow loser since your birth, outside of Japan, the most unlikely hero comes to your rescue in the form of the Microsoft Store. That's right, the storefront I once called the worst use of 42 megabytes has your back. There's a great video by one of the RE7 speedrun mods ZGL which explains exactly how you can download the COD version and I'll link that in the description because I never would have figured this out without it. So the first step is going to require you coming to terms with the fact that this is a pay to win speedrun because it's time to buy another copy from the Microsoft Store. Luckily it's included with the Xbox Game Pass which being the coupon cutting deal sniffing dude that I am it only set me back a dollar to just be better. Now this is completely unrelated but I do feel I need to announce that I will be retiring from Resident Evil 7 speedrunning at the end of this month and please respect that choice. Don't spray any rumors, because I mean, of course I could buy it. Like, of course I could buy the game if I wanted to. I just don't want to. Now that you're the proud owner of RE7 through Microsoft, you just need to swap your computer's region to Japan and download the game. Once it's installed, you need to launch it and make sure your saves are still there. So it turns out the way Steam Store saves is completely different than how the Microsoft version does, and no matter how hard I tried, I just never found a way to bring my saves over, and couldn't even find a completed save online to just drop in for this version. I can't believe this is happening! So what exactly does that mean for you? Well for the New Game Plus category, you're gonna need a few different things before your New Game Plusing to your full potential. The first is the Albert O1R, which is the strongest pistol in the game, and to unlock this you just need to play through it once. The next is the Circular Saw, which you get for finishing under 4 hours, but I don't know if you're watching this video, you're one of the fastest gamers out there. So just finish the game, you'll get the saw. The next thing you're going to need is the walking shoes, which increase Ethan's walk and crouch speed. These are unlocked by destroying all 20 Mr. Everywhere bobbleheads across the entire campaign. And this really isn't as bad as it sounds, as long as you don't mind flushing your dignity straight down the toilet. Just pull up a guide on the other monitor and get cracking. After all, you're here to play fast, not rub your face on every inch of the world looking for these little turds. The last thing you'll need is infinite ammo, which is unlocked with another playthrough, but this time on the hardest difficulty, Madhouse. And even with the Albert and with the saw unlocked, this isn't a walk in the park. There's more enemies and not only do they hit so hard, but they also have way more health. And I mean, the boss is in this mode. It's a little known fact, but the term bullet sponge was actually coined after someone shot Marge's spongy front butt 50 times over and she didn't even blink. So that's two full playthroughs and 20 Mr. Everward dolls so you get completely set up for your first run. My first playthrough took me 2 hours and 45 minutes, while the second Madhouse run took 4.5 hours. So in total it's going to take around 8 hours to save 25 seconds, but it's all for the greater good. And honestly it isn't a bad rite of passage to becoming a New Game Plus runner. Now let's get on with it and learn the route. I couldn't be happy to report that learning Easy New Game Plus is an absolute breeze thanks to some really amazing guides put together by community members. The first thing I recommend doing is check out the comprehensive guide for this specific category from Rossi Rossi, Yossi Hop, ZGL, and Marforia. It walks you through literally the entire game explaining every strat through the run, and this guide was something I went back to over and over. It might not be perfectly up to date with all the strats in the current world record run, mainly missing a few checkpoint restart spots, but I would say it's about 98% correct and I think it probably took about a fourth of the time it would have taken me to learn the run scrubbing through forum posts and other people's completed runs. 
Now this category can take between two hours to one hour, 26 minutes and 55 seconds. And with a run that size, I'm not gonna be able to touch on everything. There are of course a lot of small things throughout the entire run, but in my opinion, there are just a few different sections to focus on learning in order to improve as quickly as possible. And I'll explain them as they come up. But first, let's just start with an overview of the basic gameplay in RE7. Of course, it's an FPS, but more importantly, it's an item and inventory management game. In just about every area, you'll be gathering up items around the map so you can unlock more doors to gather up more items. And like I said, actually figuring out where you need to be heading and which items to grab next is detailed in the guide. Plus, you've already finished the game twice, so you should already know the map like the back of your hand. But if you ever forget, just take a peek at your splits, which can be set up to include just about every item you can pick up in the game thanks to an amazing auto splitter made by Cursed Toast. So in my opinion, the thing you need to focus on is inventory management. Ethan only has 4 weapon slots and 8 slots for items, which will fill up and get garbled around in a second if you don't wrestle it back into submission. Essentially, when opening the inventory, you can move around, use, or even delete the items you have selected. But the thing that makes this really cool is that the selected slot doesn't move even after closing the menu, and any items you pick up will go into the first empty slot. So if you want to put in the work, you can reduce the amount of time you waste in menus to almost zero. I think it's one of the most satisfying things in the entire run when you just need to spam F coming up to a door because you've already mapped out your inventory for this exact moment 5 minutes ago. It's something that I didn't really think would be a big deal if I ignored it when starting out, but I'll just go ahead and let these clips speak for themselves. So with the basics out of the way, let's jump to the start of the run, which kicks off with Ethan arriving in Louisiana searching for his wife. As soon as you get control, start running until you reach the guest house, and then keep running there too. After heading into the cellar and finding Mia and promptly losing her again, it's time to prepare for the first big trick of the game, Mia acts one shot. Turns out she's been hanging out the last three years donked out of her mind on mold, and it's turned her into something that legally I can't call a deadite. So instead, let's just say that she's now a Schmedite. The first Mia fight starts after Ethan is sent through a wall, but little did she know that would go on to be the biggest mistake of her life as there so happens to be an axe in that room and Ethan's about to throw every physics book out the window to completely delete her with it. Normally in this fight you slap her with the axe which has both light and heavy attacks until she finally kicks it, but it turns out there's a much faster way to finish the fight by clipping into her hitbox at the start and doing a heavy swing, which with some luck will goof up your camera and register hits on every frame. In a good fight you can one shot her, but I'll just say this is very hard to do and something I only managed to do once in either practice or actual runs. The problem with practicing being that you need to sit through almost 2 minutes of cutscenes before each attempt, and this will be a running theme I'll touch on later. The important thing to note here though is that this trick is frame rate dependent, and the one shot is potentially impossible if you can't get over 120 FPS. So head into your graphics settings and do what needs to be done. Nuke the texture quality, shadow quality, and as a last resort you can even drop the resolution scaling down to 0.5 and play through squinted eyes. <coughs> also make sure to turn off V-Sync, otherwise it's all for nothing. And this is a pretty precise trick, and for me if I managed to get a two shot kill here, I was pretty happy. With Mia down, head over and pick up the phone before going back to grab the axe wherever it dropped. If you had a good fight, it should be right on your path. If not, then take the walk of shame and grab it, then eventually head upstairs for the Mia 2 fight. This fight has a very similar trick to the first, the goal being one shot as soon as it starts, but this one has actual lineups to help you get really consistently good fights. Plus it's really quick and easy to practice, and it's a must that you have your lineups down, because if she manages to slip away before you do enough damage, she'll ruin your run in a couple seconds. And then once she's dead, you're past the first big barrier into getting a good run going. So let's make a quick change in scenery and head over to the main house. After regaining control of Ethan, head down this hallway to grab a hatch key and interact with the door down the hall to set yourself up for a quick trigger later. From here, there are two different ways to finish up. Either attempt to manipulate Jack to come down the hall with you so you can force him to bust down a wall. Or just move past him and use the boring old doors. I spent a long time trying to manipulate Jack to do what I wanted him here, but it feels really inconsistent. Sometimes he'll instantly grab you, or swing his dumb little shovel, or even just stand around scratching himself. And I spent a long time here during practice, and most times I'd think he's far enough down the hall just to turn around and see him standing around like a dingus wasting my precious seconds. Luckily though, taking the slow path will only lose a couple seconds, so it's not going to be the end of the world if you don't get it during a run. After heading through the hatch, grab all your new game plus items from the chest, and then go get a dinky little pocket knife from the super stingy deputy. Pocket knife, that's it. 
Finally run to the garage for the first jack fight. And this one's pretty much a freebie, but there is a chance that the flimsy shelf normally held together by scotch tape and toothpicks is replaced by one forged by the gods that will pretty much kill your run right off the bat. But I only saw this once in my 50 or so fights with them, so it's safe to say the chance of this happening again in our universe are pretty much astronomical. The actual strat for this fight starts off by putting three shots into Jack while backpedaling towards the car, then putting another two in after he breaks the shelf. While he gets in the car, trash just about everything Ethan stuffed in his pockets, and then after Jack's iframes are through, shoot him once more ending his one second long joyride. With that behind you, take a breather and try to keep cool as you move towards what is without a doubt the hardest trick in the entire game. It's an out of bounds skip which allows you to grab a red key card early and sets us up to take a very optimized route to the last required item to leave the main house. The strat begins just after you grab the wooden statue from a tub which will actively make you dirtier just being in its presence. Daddy Jack comes through a door and from here until you make it out of bounds you need to have near perfect menuing and movement to perform the skip. As soon as you get control shoot Jack in the leg, not the body, and definitely not between his legs. <laughs> And at the same time start sprinting forward, then drop down the stairs and fire more shots to keep aggro on Jack upstairs. Stick the pendulum in the clock and move your pointer to the wooden statue, and ideally Jack hasn't fallen down the stairs before you grab the white dog head from the clock, but I spent a lot of time on this section actually doing it and emulating different top runs, and I never found a way to consistently get Jack to drop at the same time, so you need to improvise a bit depending on if he's in the hallway or the dining room. Keep shooting to get him to chase you, and it's important he's close enough to you in the long haul so he won't scumbag teleport in front of you to bust through the wall and ruin the entire setup. At the end of the hall, quickly turn around where you got the hatch key and shoot this guy somewhere in the chest. If you hit him in the legs, he'll die later and your run's also going to be dead, so make sure to at least sort of aim. After he's staggered, head through the main room and do this cute little shadow puzzle, and if you get to the thing and the prompt is locked, it means you messed up somewhere along the way, and you can either kite jack around and try again, losing a ton of time, or just accept defeat and reset. And let me tell you, the difference between doing the puzzle and failing is about a second or less, so the execution has to be so precise. And something you should know that I personally found out, if you don't do that puzzle before continuing on, the game will be soft locked just after you pick up the red key card, and you'll need to come all the way back upstairs to do it anyways, so it's kinda now or never with this thing. After finishing up the puzzle, Jack should be kicking his way into the room shortly. You're gonna need to kite him onto the stairs, bring him to his old man knees, and then assert your dominance on him by phasing through the wall. Once you've made it this far, the end of the strat is within your reach, you just need to close out with a free fall back in bounds. This also requires pretty precise timing to not fall forever into the void, or get stuck in the ceiling like you just made a bad roll in Jumanji. I once dreamt of a new strat I called the Poots and Dudes 2 Tap Method, where I quickly paused the game twice in a row at the start of the fall, and then so cleanly fell to the floor as it perfectly loaded in beneath me. It's so goddamn stylish and sleek it makes me sick. But as I went on to find out, this is actually a terrible idea, and level streaming doesn't always happen in uniform time, and I had plenty of time to ponder this with my feet dangling 20 feet above the floor like a grown man that tempted fate getting into a baby bucket swing, and after getting stuck just has to hang there in utter embarrassment until help finally comes. But luckily if you sit there long enough, the game will eventually take pity on you and set you back to where you first clipped through the wall, and if that's the worst thing that happens during the whole trick, then that's not bad in my book. After you make it into the red keycard room, just grab that bad boy and breathe out a big sigh of relief, because the rest of the run is easy peasy from here on out compared to the trick you just expertly pulled off. Go pick up the dissection room key and use it to get into the room with a red dog head. After picking it up, you'll find yourself in the Jack 2 fight, and by fight, I mean Jack's second round of spankings. Shoot him once, then pull out the saw until he moves to the fence, then grab the chainsaw and get that inventory in order again. After another bullet and a few more seconds rubbing your teeth on him, he'll be done and you can start making your way to the old house. Now from the red keycard skip, I think there are only two big sections where you need to worry about losing time, and they're both boss fights. Well, that's special. The good news is both fights have really consistent strats and great guides, but because they both require some precise shooting and timing, they can start to fall apart within the first seconds of either fight. The first fight takes place a couple minutes after getting to the old house with gross bug lady Marge. It starts when she busts through the window and right away you need to start backpedaling from her grab and hit her in the face twice, then start sawing her right away and finish out with one more bullet to the face before she leaves. After that, you can manipulate her AI by facing away from the window to get her to spawn there again and start in with the saw. Eventually, she'll hop down the stairs, and if you've done the fight correctly, she'll die in a couple more shots at the bottom of those stairs. But in my experience, this fight rarely goes correctly, and the resulting time loss can span anywhere from a second to almost a minute. <clears throat> right off the bat, coming up the stairs, you need to already know where a head hitbox will be during our animation, otherwise you're going to miss completely or not do enough damage fast enough. After that, make sure you're on the correct side of the window when she comes back out, otherwise instead of hopping down the stairs, she'll move into the other corner so hard it sends her into another dimension and lean to go find and fight her like a dirty casual pleb. Even if she heads down the stairs, if you didn't hit your shots in the window, she has a chance to start climbing on the walls before she dies, and this lady is the kind that'll will herself to stay alive just through pure hatred of speedrunning, meaning once she latches onto that wall, you can bring her health far below the threshold which would normally kill her, and she'll only die after she makes it back to a neutral position, and Ethan deals one single extra point of damage. As I said though, this shouldn't be a hard fight, and you should really only start sweating if she gets close to one of her grubby little holes. 
From here, the run sets into a nice flow for the next 20 minutes of heading from place to place, grabbing items, and shooting a couple moldy men along the way. There really isn't much danger here, and it's pretty much just about streamlined movement and item management. But this relaxed pace quickly comes to an end as you reach the second tough boss fight, Jack 3. I will deal with you later. Just like March, this is an easy fight, but it's also super easy to lose a ton of time if you have problems performing under pressure. The fight starts about an hour into the run, and the first thing you need to do is shoot a single bullet at Jack's face, then run to a point where you can see through a little gap in the wood. At this point, you'll see a small eye moving around for about a second on the bottom floor, and that's what you need to hit with one of the two bullets left in your gun, and you need to do this every single run without fail. If you manage to hit the eye, it's destroyed, and you can easily finish out the rest of the fight on the bottom floor with a saw and pistol, but if you miss, there will never be another chance of one cycle Jack on the bottom floor. Once you drop down, the lower eye can only be destroyed if he climbs back up while you're below him, and then he only moves to the next phase after coming back down to the bottom floor, so just missing that shot can easily cost you about half a minute. And honestly, from here, the rest of the run is cake. Once on the ship, there's pretty much just one place where you can lose about 20 seconds, and it should never happen after you learn the setup for the trick, which is opening this door and then briskly walking through it. They said this again. For the rest of the run, just remember the route, and it's as simple as moving from one place to the next, grabbing items, and doing a few small tricks here and there, and then before you know it, the credits will be rolling and Ethan Winters will be heading off into the sunset. I can only assume to live out the rest of his days, cherishing the use of all of his limbs and digits. Now with all the reading, practice, and other boring bits in your rear view, it's time to talk about what it's like to run Resident Evil 7. One thing I loved about RE7 when first playing it was the incredible atmosphere it builds with its in-game cinematics. I mean, casually these are amazing and help you feel really grounded in what Ethan's struggling with, but we aren't playing casually, and you might want to sit down before I say this. RE7 is absolutely riddled with unskippable cutscenes. From the moment you start a new run, you're greeted with exactly 2 minutes and 33 seconds of animation, and it doesn't stop there. In the first 20 minutes of the hour and a half long run, you'll spend about 10 minutes locked in cinematics, animations, or walking auto-scrollers, and I'll be honest, it makes it really hard to find the willpower to grind out runs. I've been bad. I deserve this. Especially when the hardest part of the run comes about 24 minutes into it, right after you've walked to the guest house, slow walked through the water, walked even slower with Mia, got stabbed by Mia, got stabbed by Mia again, waited for Jack, had a nice meal with the bakers, and finally talked with a cop who I suspect wouldn't mind reading your name in the obituaries. But I don't think it necessarily makes RE7 a bad speed game, because I actually really enjoyed running it, but the first 20 minutes up until you get the knife has a completely different pace and feel that you'll just have to learn to cope with any way you can. I found solace in this pile of cans you can push around for about a second, and who wouldn't love stacking boxes and mannequins on top of Mia while waiting for Jack to show up? Now if that's a deal breaker for you, there is a category extension called No Guest House which, well, it skips the guest house. Starting the run right from where you get your items and also where the fun starts, there isn't a better word for what I think about the rest of the run. It's just fun. After you memorize the route and can safely close the any percent guide tab without having a mild panic attack, you can feel yourself getting better with every single run. Your pre aim at enemies around corners gets crisp and your movement just keeps getting better as you perfect every line you need to take moving anywhere. And like I mentioned before, having close to perfect inventory management throughout the entire run just feels awesome. This is also a pretty low stress run, which maybe is obvious when considering it's being played on easy with infinite ammo and the strongest weapons, but it takes the extra layer of rooting ammo pickups and crafting materials completely out of the run and focuses it only on the raw basics of shooting buttholes and picking up junk around the house, which makes it super accessible once you've put in the upfront work of actually unlocking those things. Resident Evil 7 is a great horror game, and while some aspects that work well for it as horror end up hurting the run, I think it's more than worth a look if you're a fan of spooky stuff or shooters. There's quite the laundry list of stuff to do before being able to start your first run, but once you've done that, it's really easy to pick up thanks to the RE7 community members that came before and put their hearts into the game. Even if the slow start turns you off, the no guest house category is more than worth a look even if it's far less active than the base category. What does everyone hate me? And now let's check out the results. I ended up making 22 attempts, of which I finished 6. After my initial practice run, I managed to finish with a 140-45 on my third attempt, which is over an hour quicker than my original easy new game playthrough. Over the course of a week, I slowly brought that time lower and lower into the 130s, finishing with a 136-39 my fourth attempt, then 132-34. It seemed like every run I was seeing huge gold splits, and at that point I was happy enough with my time and placement in the top 100, but I wasn't feeling satisfied with how many glaring mistakes were in that run. Feeling that I could shave at least a minute off the time, I went back and made another 6 unsuccessful attempts before finishing with a final time of 1.31 on the dot on my 22nd attempt. And while that wasn't a perfect run, I'm happy to take that time, slot into a nice and cozy 47th position, and look towards my next project.
I'm sending tons of kisses. Bye, baby.